quite honestly, how often do you get to even say, not just sing, potentate of time? It's, it's a great line, isn't it? Very true, but a great line. Uh, I, I hope you detected even from the beginning of the service that, that I believe that Easter continues. In fact, the church affirms that Easter doesn't just happen on Easter Sunday. There shouldn't just be 40 days of gloom through Lent, which I very much like Lent. I was a late adopter in life. Um, <clears throat> there shouldn't just be 40 days of gloom and then one day of celebration, and then we're back to the normal routine. It's supposed to be eight days of celebration, and if you look at the actual calendar that's constructed for the church, it's about as much time before Easter as after Easter. So we should be celebrating right now the promise of God through resurrection that gives us new life now and new life later. There's a lot of promise involved in that, but there's a lot of new life that we can even live right now because of what God has done through Jesus Christ. And as we've already been reminded this morning, the sermon series we've been focusing on, the last week was part of that, the week before was part of that, we've been in it for a while, uh, is really uh, asking a question. The statement is, God's plans include you. The question is, do your plans include God? And, and we're going to take off on that today with another statement and a question. As we look at a, a post-resurrection appearance of Jesus to his disciples and particularly to Thomas. In fact, I'm going to encourage you to find John 20. It's just a continuation of where we were last week. Uh, we'll, we'll look at it in just a moment. John 20, 19. Find it in your Bible, mobile device, however you read it. But follow along. The question is this. You see, Jesus gives the gift of peace. The question is, what's your response when Jesus gives this out? Stephanie and I, my wife, were watching uh, a video from America's Funniest Videos last week, and I, I really enjoy that show. And um, it was baby birth announcements. You know, so the announcement, the, the people have the cameras rolling, and they tell a grandma-to-be, you're going to be, you're going to have your first grandchild, and you get to see the screaming and the, the very interesting responses sometimes, but my favorite are the kids, you see. And the last one was great. Uh, you know, I mean, a, a life is a gift, right? Even a sibling is a gift. Some days we don't feel that way, maybe. But um, so these two little kids, probably an eight-year-old and a five-year-old, the parents are off, you know, because they're behind the camera, and they say, you're going to have a baby brother. And the eight-year-old is kind of like, okay, I should be excited, and starts to get excited. Yeah, this is good. And the five-year-old just, you watch her face as it goes to tears, but they aren't joyful tears. These are tears of ultimate sadness. She just walks away slowly, just as sad as can be. Being offered a gift, but it's an interesting response. We're just, we see that Jesus gives this gift of peace in John 20. And there's some interesting responses. So let's look at that. John 20, we're going to read 19 through 29. It won't be on the screen because it's a bit long. So follow along or listen. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, which just FYI is twin, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. 
if you follow the story back, we looked at this last week, John 20, what happens right before this. Mary goes to the tomb. She sees that it's empty. She runs back. She gets Peter and John. They come running to the tomb, have a little foot race. They see that the tomb is empty, and then they leave. Mary sticks around. She sees that Jesus is there, although she mistakes him for the gardener. And then she realizes, wait, this is Jesus. She latches onto him, and Jesus says, now go tell the disciples. And we know what happens next. We just read it. The disciples go around, and they say, well, yeah, Jesus is around here somewhere. They're out looking, right? No, they're sitting in a locked room. They have the witness of Mary coming to them, and they're sitting in a locked room for fear, knowing that the resurrected Christ may, in fact, be out there. I don't know how much, I've never been chased by people, I mean, other than tag, you know, and hide and seek, but I've never been chased, I've never been sitting in fear for my life, that's apparently what they're doing. You know, we're in tornado season, a lot of us have sat hunkered down in basements before, um, sometimes with fear, sometimes, you know, there's no fear because you're like, that tornado's way off. Um, I've sat through forest fires where there was fear. I remember uh, vividly when, when Stephanie and I, though, in, in tornado country, we were in Indianapolis our kids were very small. We were living in a parsonage, 100 yards from the church. Sheets of rain, no basement, tornadoes in the area, and you're, you're, at that moment, you are a little afraid. We're responsible for these little lives. Should we go into a bathroom? There are tornadoes around. Should we run through the rain? And if there's no tornado, our kids are soaked and awake. I mean, you're, and you're sitting there kind of fearful, like, what's going to happen here? We can't tell what's going on around us. The disciples are living in that world. They're in this fearful state, and Jesus comes in. And he brings peace. And, and, and three things jumped out of the text at me this week, among a whole lot of things. But I'll bring just three to you today. The first is Jesus gives peace to the fearful. He walks in and he gives a very common greeting. In fact, even in the Middle East, it's still common today to have somebody wish you peace. Jesus says, peace be upon you, peace be on you, or with you, actually. It's, an, it's a common greeting, but it's an uncommon scenario. They are not in a peaceful situation, sitting locked in a room, and Jesus magically appears before them. And he says, peace. And, and in the ancient world, just like today in the Middle East, when people wish peace, it means a lot more than we often mean. Shalom would be the word behind what Jesus is offering. Not just that I wish nothing would be wrong in your life, but I wish you the highest good. That's what Jesus is saying. He says, I, I wish you to be reconciled and whole. I wish you not just to survive, but to thrive. That's peace, like Jesus is bringing them. That's what the greeting brought. And Jesus comes in in a fearful situation, and he brings peace. He breaks through the walls of our fear and our uncertainty, giving us something better. Jesus offers this gift to us, and a gift must be received in order to be enjoyed. As a pastor, I find it an honor to be involved in people's lives. People come to me at good times. People come to me at difficult times, and, and I'm, I'm always honored. I don't want difficult times to happen, but I'm honored when I get brought in because I'm a part of the family, and you're trusting me. I appreciate that. Um, people come in, as I've told you many times, during the week as well. We sometimes get about one a week. People who need help for various things. Uh, finances, rent, all kinds of things, some of which we, we often can't do a lot for, but we can point them in the right direction. And, and I, I consider it an honor to help in those cases, too. I treat everybody with dignity and respect when they come in, giving them the benefit of the doubt, because 90% of the time, people are on the up and up. They need help. And, and I know some people come in and they say, I, you know, I've had people recently, I, I'm homeless. I have no place to live. And they need help. And we can only help a little bit, but I can point them and say, okay, here's rental assistance that's, that's out there. Here's this, here's that, here's the other. And the people who need help take it. And you know what they are? They're grateful. A gift. And I'm not claiming to give it. It's, it's other people that are giving that gift. But they're grateful. Jesus comes and he offers us something like that. It, it, especially if we're fearful or if we're lost in some way. He's offering us something new. He's offering us the highest good. And the question is, what do we do with that? How are we receiving that? Or do we receive that at all? The second thing I saw in the text is that Jesus breathes new life into the discouraged. 
So doubt persists among the witnesses or among the soon-to-be witnesses. Mary saw Jesus. She's told to go and tell the other disciples. She tells the other disciples, at least that's what we get by implication. And they're sitting fearful. Then they see Jesus. Then they're witnesses all of a sudden. What do they do? They tell Thomas who wasn't there. And does he believe immediately? No. There's doubt all the way through. And too often, doubt is our default position. We, we live in a, a society that, that really has that. We, are, we have a lot of skepticism about a lot of things. And so we have the attitude of Thomas. I'm not going to believe it until I can touch it. And I personally think Thomas is asking for more than he needs at this point. But what's interesting about it is Thomas doesn't start from a place of doubt, at least if we're to look at all the disciples and the story of the disciples. He really, uh, when Jesus says, don't doubt but believe, what Jesus really says, if you look at the, the Greek that's there in the original text, he says, don't unbelieve but believe. And, and so Thomas has shifted is what he's done. He's, doubt really isn't, isn't just not believing in something. It's believing in something different now than you did before. So it causes you to think differently about what you believed in the first place. But Thomas had something to believe in before this all happened, before Jesus went to the cross that should have told him something different. And I'm not going to say, I, I kind of feel like I would have been in Thomas's camp. None of the disciples were believing at this point. They didn't know Jesus was going to rise from the dead. They were locked in the room, right? But then when they see, they change their tune. If you go back to John 14, though, the disciples had a word ahead of time that something was going to happen. It's not the only word. Back in John 14, 25, it'll come up on the screen. He's been telling him, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you something. And he says, all this I have spoken while still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Does that sound familiar? I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. It's not like they were left, and again, this isn't the only instance, without some idea that something was up, that Jesus was going to do something different and unexpected. He'd been doing unexpected things the whole time he'd been with them. They'd been with him for a while. He says, I'm going to go away. I'm going to come back. I'm leaving you the Holy Spirit. I'm giving you peace, even now. And it's not like Thomas had no basis then to believe. Just like the other disciples, they'd shifted to something different. Do you find that you have unbelief? I don't know. Do you find that, that things have ever shifted in your life? You had a basis, but they've moved. I knew somebody um, a number of years ago who had been very involved in praying for healing for other people. And healings had happened wonderful man and then he died of cancer he and and he had his doubts on some days why in the world i've prayed for people they've been healed why at this point then god am i not being healed but he didn't doubt till the end he still had a hope that was deeper than that it didn't shift to unbelief or to a, a doubt in god fully it was just certain days it was hard but he believed but sometimes we can shift to unbelief. Thomas, think about it. Thomas had been with Jesus for a while. He had seen the healings. All the disciples had been there for those things. They had seen Jesus cast out demons. They had watched Jesus calm storms. This guy was capable of some big things. They had a basis for belief prior to this. Thomas is cast throughout the Gospels as a bit of a skeptic. And that might be all right. We can have that. As a, as a way, sort of a, a default at times. But Thomas had belief. But sometimes what was happening didn't meet up with expectations, and that often happens with us, doesn't it? And then we start to doubt, wait a minute, what's really going on here? But, but one of the big issues 
And, and I think, like I said, Thomas is asking for too much. He's starting from the skeptic's foundation. It's not bad to question something. That's not what I'm saying. But the skeptic foundation is prove it about everything. And that's really what Thomas is asking for. It's not that he's just uh, he's saying, I won't believe until I see. He's saying, prove it. I want to touch the wound of Jesus. That's a different attitude all of a sudden. And, and the foundation for a skeptic is prove it. The difference and a foundation that I think is important is not that we can't check our facts and check things out. That's perfectly fine. But the foundation of one who then believes is a graceful position instead of doubting it's the benefit of the doubt. We, we say, okay, maybe there's something there. I want to believe there's something there rather than just prove it. If you want to contrast these attitudes, we could do it as uh, it, you can imagine at one point you might have been a teenager or you are. Um, and you might have questioned your parents. I don't know if you ever did that. Um, why in the world, mom and dad, can't I base jump off the roof or whatever it was that you were going to do? I don't know why you were going to do that. But we question our parents growing up. Why won't you allow me to do this? But there's different attitudes we can bring to this, right? We can bring, well, I'm going to trust that you have my best interest in mind. Or why don't you ever want me to have any fun? Right? It's a totally different attitude. Same thing before you. It's not that you can't question, but the attitude behind it matters, and how we approach it matters. God had promised, Jesus had delivered, the Holy Spirit persists, and we should recognize something from the language of what Jesus is doing. He's breathing life into disciples that have been discouraged. And he gives that same thing to us. Let's go way back in the Bible for just a moment. Genesis 2, verse 7. It says, and this is the second telling of creation. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. What does Jesus do? He comes to the disciples in verse 22. And it says, and with that he breathed on them. There's an overtone there that shouldn't be missed. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. New life comes through Jesus Christ. The work of Jesus on the cross, the resurrection, new power to live that life comes through the Holy Spirit. And Jesus gives them that in this moment to the discouraged. He says, here's something new. Here's new life. Finally, I would say Jesus gives a blessing to the grateful. If you go to verse 29, Jesus says, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Catch that word blessed in there. Uh, for those of you that have been around for a while, um, you may remember at the beginning of the year, we talked about that word blessed a lot albeit from a different gospel, it's the same word. Blessed, I credit Daryl Johnson, a pastor in Vancouver, British Columbia, for a definition that means living in sync with God. It doesn't just mean getting something, but living in sync with the very heart of God. You are blessed. You are living in, in a heartbeat with me, understanding my will. That's what it's saying. Jesus said, you're blessed if you believe and you didn't even see. And what are the signs of that blessing that Jesus gives us? The first thing, I think, is, goes back to that issue of peace. We need to look for the peace that Jesus gives around us. We need to give it away. Those are the signs of peace. We're desiring the best for the people we worship with. We're desiring the best for the people outside of this place. That things would be right, whole, reconciled in the world. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. That's what we're about if we follow Jesus Christ. If you go back to verse 23, you see some very powerful words. Jesus says, and these are scary words without the power of the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. That's Jesus' peace in action. Reconciliation. You people that have witnessed, that have seen this, or even believed without seeing. 
are the ones who then get to take that piece out. And this is how it's done. We've already heard from Warren Wearsby this morning. Let me quote the brother as well. He says, humans declared war on God, but God would declare peace to those who would believe. And that's what we're supposed to do once we've received that peace from Jesus Christ. Be those who bring that peace. It comes, as I said, through forgiveness. That is another sign. It's the way to receive God's love, to be made whole, to be, made, to be reconciled with God. It is also the way we give God's love, that peace, that forgiveness. Without forgiveness, we don't really know what peace is. If we're not willing to dispense that, we don't really know what peace is. Because peace is being made whole, reconciled with God. The other thing is that we are witnesses. We need to look for witnesses around us if we have that new life in Christ. And we also need to be witnesses for one another. It's important because when you look at John, and not John, Thomas, excuse me, and the other disciples, John was one of those named earlier, they actually didn't really believe each other right away, did they? They, they had to see Jesus. They had other witnesses. Like, well, I'm not sure about that. But we have other witnesses. We need to rely on the witness of other believers to help us along as we are forgiving as we are givers of peace that Jesus brings, as we live life in the power of the Holy Spirit. Heard a great story. It's very fictitious this week, but you'll enjoy it. Uh, there's a lawyer who, uh, he has a client who's guilty of murder, but they've never found the body. It's obvious his client is guilty. Everybody knows it. And uh, in a last-ditch effort to try and throw off the jury, uh, we'll say that the victim was named John, um, He's talking to the jury, and he says, look, John's about to come through the door. And he looks, because there was never a body. He thought, maybe they'll believe. And all the jury looks at the door, waiting for this guy who is supposedly dead to come through. And then they're thrown into doubt, and they go to deliberate for a while. And they come back very quickly, and uh, to the surprise of the lawyer. And he finds out later, they come back with a guilty verdict, never was a body, and the lawyer is able to check up on this, and he, he talks to one of the jurors, and he says, why in the world? How, how did you do it so fast, and how did you come up with the guilty verdict? And they said, simple. We all looked at the door, but your client didn't look at the door. <laughs> we have witnesses for a reason, to help remind us of what's going on, what we're on about, the power of the Holy Spirit, new life in Christ. We have to trust those who are peace givers and peace bringers around us. As we, I want to draw this to a conclusion, and I want to point out again, I think Thomas asks for too much. I think he asks for more than he needs for belief. And I think the attitude that he brings, and, and this, is, this is factual about Thomas, and I'm not saying I'm better than Thomas because I'm not. I highly regard the disciples. But Thomas brings an attitude that we ought not bring as well. Prove it. To the one he loves. I use um, a book called Getting Ready for Marriage for Premarital Counseling. Very good book. Um, and this, it's written by two authors. This particular section is written by Doug Fields. And I think he gives a good idea of the attitude that we need to have towards Jesus. He says, I remember an evening when Kathy, that's his wife, was running late, and I was frustrated and said, if I knew you were going to be late, I could have stayed at work longer and got something done instead of just waiting around here. Didn't you tell me to be home right at 6 o'clock for dinner? Each of these comments was true in a statement of fact, but that didn't matter because they were delivered with intent to wound with guilt and shame. Let me just say that dinner wasn't as good as it could have been had I simply held my words and especially my tone. Sadly, the issue that caused the tension wasn't Kathy being late. It was my tone. And this is the important part. What's even worse is that I would, never, I would have never used that tone with somebody at work or even a stranger. And I expressed it with the person I love the most in the entire world. 
I appreciate Thomas. I appreciate the disciples. I probably would have been locked in a room too. But even now, we have the other side of the story. Even now, Jesus offers us the gift of peace. Out of love, total, complete, and pure love. And our attitude by which we accept that, by which we come before Jesus, even when we have those dates, days of doubt and unbelief, matter. And we come before the one who loves us so deeply and so greatly. It's not bad to ask questions. But we have to be ready to respond like the disciples did. They were overjoyed when they figured it out. Even Thomas, in his doubt, did he actually ever touch the body? Jesus says, you've seen me. Thomas asked for more than he needed. Jesus says, you've seen me. He never touched it. And he said, my Lord and my God. Jesus offers peace. What's your response? For some of us, we do have attitudes that cause problems. We do have a prove-it attitude when it comes to God. Like I said, it's okay to ask questions, but sometimes we need to check that attitude. God, everything seems to be going wrong in my life. I'm fearful. I'm discouraged. Why? We have, to, we have to be careful in how we ask why, not in that we ask why. We can ask, where are you about God? In certain times, they can be difficult, just like the friend who is dying from cancer. Why, God? I don't get it, but the attitude matters. And an openness to receive a response from God matters. Are you one that asks for more than you believe? God, I'll believe that you're going to do this if you do X, Y, Z, and, and we go on and start adding letters. I don't know why I stopped at the end of the alphabet. Are you truly grateful for the peace that you've been given? Are you a blessing to others as you've been blessed? Let's pray. God, may we start at the place of unbelief, even when we ask why, even when we're not sure, even when we have a hard time trusting those around us who've witnessed your goodness. God, help us move from unbelief to belief. Help us receive your peace with open arms. Help us give your peace as if there's no end in sight to the amount of peace we were given. Out of your abundance, God, out of the power of the Holy Spirit, help us give peace, help us be those who forgive, who reconcile people who are broken personally, who are broken in relationship with one another. God, help us as we look to you and make sure that we are reconciled with you and made right that we have an attitude that gives the benefit of the doubt to all that you're doing around us, even when we don't understand. God, give us belief, not unbelief. If we have unbelief, God, give it to us only, only in how surprised we are at what you've done, that we could receive you and say, my Lord and my God, that we could receive you and be overjoyed by the disciples, or like the disciples. God, help us receive your peace through Jesus Christ. Amen.